you from Kansas City in the USA, in the, right in the middle for those people who are not from the US. Oh, hi, Anne. Hello, hi, Maria. How are you guys doing? Um, yeah, I know this is uh, not the best time, but um, I feel like we're all doing pretty well at making do. I think I was supposed to actually still be in Daegu for the next couple weeks, um, but they cut our season short, which is probably for the best, just to be safe. Um, Koreans were definitely very good about um, making sure that the, the safety of, of everybody in the country was first and foremost, as opposed to opening everything as soon as possible, like in the US. <laughs> um, so yeah, very, very fortunate to have been there during the COVID crisis. Um, oh, how are you guys? This is so crazy. I have never done this before. I'm, uh, I'm in my parents' uh, living room. Um, it is 11 in the morning. Um, I'm so sorry for all the people who are up at like 2 in the morning um, over on in the east. I really appreciate you guys saying hi. Um, this is so crazy. So good to see you all. I miss you. Um, yeah, it was kind of an unfortunate way to end the Korea season. Korea, Korean season. I haven't woken up yet. Um, with a little injury. Um, but I'm doing better. Um, it's, uh, yeah, for all of you who are wondering what happened, um, I was FaceTiming and was distracted and walking at night and did not see the sidewalk and bam, smack on the sidewalk. And that is why I did not finish the, <laughs> the season in Daegu. Such a stupid accident, but, um, I will be back. I'm already feeling great and probably if I had to, could do the show right now. Um, they gave me... I had a cast for a couple weeks, and then I have a splint. So this thing is like, I got this in Daegu. So it looks like, like this. <laughs> my, my family's like, it's like a gun. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, oh, hi guys. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I am on the mend, and uh, I am in Kansas City with my family. My par I'm up staying at my parents' house, and um, my sister and her husband and my nephew and niece live um, just down the street, so I get to see them every day, and uh, we get to play and catch up and do all... They're, like, one, one is one... <laughs> my nephew is three, and my niece is one, and they're at, like, this great age. My niece is just about to start to walk. My nephew is um, fully verbal at this point, so we're having full-on conversations and uh, and doing all the sorts of fun... I'm the fun uncle, so I get to go crazy with him and get him all riled up, and we have the best time. But, um, but yeah, I, you guys sent me some questions. Oh, I miss you too. Um, oh, hey, Filipinos, sending you all the best. Oh, it all started with you. You guys set the bar very high for fans, and um, we miss you so much. Can't wait to get back there one day. This is crazy. Um, I am the worst multitasker. So, oh, Eric, hello. <laughs> oh my God, you probably have notes for me. Um, oh, I love you too, Anne. Hi, Liv. Um, oh my gosh, this is what I'm saying about uh, multitasking. I'm trying to read. Oh, it's so good to see you guys. Um, trying to read and talk. Not so good at it. We did this, um, <laughs> one of our last um, press junkets was um was for Daegu and so Jonathan, Claire and me were in a room in a conference room and they instead of what they've done in Korea before is usually like we would do uh the the question would be asked in Korean, the translator would translate into English and then we would say our answer and then the person would translate it back to the Korean interviewer. And so um, this time, instead of doing that, they decided to do it simultaneously. So I, <laughs> we had such a good laugh because I could not focus because um, as I was answering the question, the, the translator, who's incredible, I don't know how she does this, she was literally listening to me and saying the translation at the exact same time, but full voice. So I just got so distracted and I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, I know this is so great that you can do this, but can we, um, can we please just like, can I speak and then you speak? So anyway, definitely, um, definitely, uh, a little, little distractible. Oh, I, oh, you guys are so sweet. Um, oh, Monet, 
I miss you. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait for us all to be able to hug each other and see each other. Um, I was hoping to come back to New York on this break, but it just doesn't seem like it's the best idea. Um, I know they've lifted the whole quarantine situation in the US, but it just seems like, unless we have to be around people, like maybe it's best that I wait. So um, we have another break in January, so I'll hopefully see my New York friends then. Um, oh, Young Tay, hello. Oh, it's our mic guy. Young Tay is awesome, and um, and he would put my mic on every day for old Raoul. I don't know if you guys, and I tried to like let you know, but that was me in the beginning, um, with the the beard and the mustache and uh, the big hat in the wheelchair. That's me. So um, he would put the the microphone into my hat and blah blah blah. So um, that's exciting. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna start to scroll a bit. Okay. Oh gosh, I don't want to miss anybody. But um, but yeah, you guys sent me some questions, and maybe I should just like dive in. Um, yeah, sending you all my best. Um, yeah, it's so crazy to be back. Um, I am probably still just acclimating. Um, the jet lag sucked for me this time around. I'm usually really good about like bouncing back. Like I try to trick my brain into being like, okay, it is nighttime, so that means. It's dark outside, that means you go to bed, and then when the sun comes up, it is time to wake up, and that is daytime. So, um, that didn't quite work around so well this time, and that's some weird, like, stomach thing. But I'm all, all back back to normal, and, um, for the most part, except for, for this. But, um, yeah, all good. I'm waving. <laughs> Wait, waving through a computer. Whoa. Um, let's see. I'll start from the beginning. Liv says... Uh, thought of the question, what do you think a modern day 2020 row would be like? Ooh. Huh. Have we talked about this before? Um, I think, yeah, Jonathan and I have mentioned how, um, back in the day, men were gentlemen and they were so chivalrous and doing all the sorts of things to the ladies. And I feel like that became sort of passe and, and girls seem to be into like the bad boys. And so anyway, so I think there's like, um, a new appreciation for, for chivalry and especially with, with, with feminism coming to the forefront and us just being like equality for everybody. I think, um, yeah. So I think the 2020 Rao would continue to be a gentleman. Cause I think he realizes that like, that's, that's a way to get the ladies. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I'm trying to think, I mean, obviously, like, the, the dress would change. Um, of course, he'd keep his black tie for, for the big gallows and, and opening nights um, at the opera house. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think, like, characteristically, if he would change. Um, yeah, uh, I think what's interesting with, with Raoul and, like, Raoul in the show, and then maybe what Raoul would be today is that I think both of them are, the way I think of it is that they, they start the show as kind of players. So I think that is definitely something that is, uh, is happening today, that um, people are, are not as quick to commit to, this, to one person. So I think that's something that is a similarity between Raoul in the show and then Raoul that would be today. So yeah, I think, I think that's... Those are my, my thoughts on that. Uh, oh, what are you thinking when you are in box five? Oh, that's great. Um, I actually prefer being in the other box because that means I get to be with Andre Ferman and, and um, Madame Ferman, Fifi, Robin. Um, we, we were a little naughty up there. We're always in character, but, um, but we get to, get to talk to each other and, and comment on what's happening, watching Christine sing, think of me. So I have more fun because I'm with other people then. Um, when I am in box five during Il Muto, I am, I'm enjoying, I mean, part of me is a little annoyed at Christine because I've been trying to reach her and she's not getting back to me. I'm getting these weird notes saying not to see her. And so, but I was like, um, so anyway, so I'm kind of like, what, what's going on? Maybe, well, maybe it's not her. Um, maybe the, I don't know. And, and we find out later that there is something, someone in the way. Um, but yeah, so it's enjoying, enjoying the ballet or sorry, enjoying the, um, Il Muto opera. And, uh, and then, but also my main focus is just, is Christine. And then 
and all the crazy stuff happens and the chandelier starts swinging. It's like, okay, let's get everyone out of here. I mean, at first I'm like, let's, as someone who has money in, in the opera, I'm thinking like, okay, let's, this is scary, but let's, um, as Fearman says, like everyone take your seats and, um, let's, the, the performance will continue. Um, but alas, it's probably not for the best. And once things start to really go to South, I'm thinking, let's get Christine and all of these people off the stage immediately. So that's, that's what, what precedes the rooftop. So, um, that's what's going on in box five. And also I'm thinking like, I have All I Ask of You coming up. And so I'm, th I'm at that point after managers, it's just a long time to be on stage. I don't know if the smoke gets me all dry, but I'm thinking like, I need a good drink of water. And it's funny because actually after, um, as I'm going up into the box, into box five, I am, uh, <laughs> I'm running off in the blackout um, from managers. And so I go off and uh, I throw off my coat to my lovely dresser, Sora. I'm gonna miss you. And, uh, and then I have uh, built in a tiny little swig of water, which is hilarious because sometimes not, there's not enough time. I'm literally like, gold, gentlemen, if you would care to take your seats. And I'm, I'm literally finishing swallowing as I'm saying this and going up the stairs to box five. So that's exciting. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm just thinking like, it's my time to sort of uh, stay in character, but also kind of like, be like, okay, I need a big gulp of water before all I ask of you. And uh, yeah, that's what's going on in box five. Let's see what else we got. Can I request a cameo to you at any time? Of course, I did one, was it yesterday? Um, yeah, for Jenny, I sang Being Alive, so that was, that was cool. Um, love that song, wanna be in that show. Um, yeah, of course. Um, what's crazy though, I'm sure some of you who are, are doing the working from home thing is that a lot of people might be sharing the same space. So I'm with my parents and, uh, my parents, um, my dad works part-time from home and then part-time out. And then my mom is the same thing. So, um, it's just finding a time that's going to be where it's quiet, where people aren't doing things in the background. And uh, so I have to try to kind of like find a time to talk to you guys, but, um, this is working out so well. Um, my dad's at the dentist, <laughs> my mom's showering, but, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, anytime I just, it's just finding the right moment where I, where people are on conference calls, zoom meetings. And so where I can actually sing if you want me to sing. Uh, so yes, please, please find me on cameo. Uh, what are your plans for life from right now? Ooh, ooh deep question. Um, if we're talking like immediate future, um, I have a break I think we start up in November, so we'll, we'll fly out to Taipei and we'll do performances. I'm really excited. We're going to be performing in an arena. So that's, that's a first for me. I think there's going to be jumbotrons and it's, it's going to be quite a, a change from, from some of the, uh, the places we've been to before. So that'll be interesting. Um, yeah, so we have that. And then we have a break and then, then we start year three. And I don't know if they've announced where we're going, so probably can't say that yet. But, uh, but then I will be continuing post-Taiwan with Phantom. So, uh, yes, I will not be leaving. Um, and then after that, who knows? I mean, I look forward to going to New York one day when the tour is over. And, uh, yeah, and getting back into the swing of things there. And I hope as soon as possible that... Um, that the New York theater scene and just New York in general will be back to a more, I don't want to say normal place, but just like back to a place of that we will recognize. Um, it's just so sad. We've seen so many of our favorite restaurants, bars, shops. Um, I've seen on Facebook that a lot of them are closing for good. And so it's so sad, but I mean, New York and theater is so resilient. So um, I have no, no question in my mind that I'll be back. It's just how long will it take? But um, safety first. Yeah, I'm no Dr. Fauci, so um, I do not have any uh, any advice except wear your masks. Everyone should wear a mask. It really helps. I mean, if we are going back to when we had our scare and what what shut us down when we were in Seoul when we had COVID within the company, it's a shocking. Like, it only affected one other person. So we um, it's insane. Um, so we all we're wearing masks and we're in close proximity to each other, riding the bus together, being backstage, singing with each other. And, um, only one other person got it. And I don't even know if that person got it from the other person. So, I mean, wear your masks. I think that's first and foremost. Um, even outside, um, it's just, uh, I think it's just, it's, I don't know. 
that's what I'm doing. Because um, what if we don't take it seriously, we might not be able to come back to get to um to tour if we get it or um aren't able to come back. It's yeah. Anyway, it's all about just being safer than sorry. Uh, hiya, Matt. What are you grateful for in spite of this insane time of COVID-19? Whew. Well, right now, I would say that one of the benefits, uh, or the plus sides of COVID is that I am home right now. I wouldn't be home at this point. Um, I was planning to be home in a couple of weeks, but uh, I get to spend a lot of family time. And and not just um, like normal family time. I feel like when I come home on breaks, there's a lot of... Um, stuff that's planned and so we have a lot of like chill time together with the family had a lovely dinner with my parents last night and we reminisced and told stories from when i was a baby that i didn't even know about i was talking about um of some of the adventures i had when i was in greece on i think it was the break after tel aviv and uh and just like travel nightmares and and just crazy and so they were they definitely won up to (laughs) me but um but yeah it's just great to spend some chill time where um, we try to put our phones down and just talk. And another thing that has gotten me through COVID, even, even while working in Korea, is just, is literally getting outside and seeing nature and just wandering around and letting your thoughts, um, materialize and, and, uh, yeah, just come, just basically like a way to, um, deal with what what's going on and checking in with with your heart and your brain and trying to see what um what's going on there because i think it's really good during this time as always to check in with with what's going on and being honest with yourself and not be like everything's great i'm fine um so yes i find that getting outside and taking walks or hikes they have helped me clear my head and kind of um, solidify what's going on and anything I'm feeling just kind of like, also, I, it's um, a way for me to be grateful. So uh, I found that um, if I feel like I'm struggling or dealing with something difficult, I think um, the time outside in the fresh air has helped me realize like, actually, that wasn't such a big deal. Or, um, you know what, in the grand scheme of things, you have this, this, and this going for you. So, um, so yeah, so I, the getting outside and, and time with, um, family has been amazing at plus sides of, of COVID. Um, yeah. Um, another thing that I, I mean to do now that I'm settled back in on the break is, is checking in with my friends and family. It's so great, um, to be able to talk to my friends um, who are in the U S because the time difference was 13 or 14 hours or, and then LA like 15 hour time difference. So like finding a time that's convenient, uh, to catch up has been hard. So, um, it's like one of us is either having to get up early or the other person has to stay up really late. And, um, so it hasn't been ideal. So I I look forward to catching up with, with um, my friends and, uh, yeah, let's, (laughs) Ooh, <laughs> I'm getting gassy. Excuse me. Um, let's see. Do you have any movies or dramas you want to recommend? Oh gosh, I should have thought about this one. Um, a couple. I've been binging a lot of things in the last few months. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Shameless is a great show that I've really enjoyed. Um, gosh. Um. Love on the Spectrum was a lovely documentary about um, people with autism who are find, looking for love. I love that. Um, i trying to think about what I watched on the plane. Oh, I watched um, Bombshell, which I f- hadn't seen about Fox News. Um, and then what was the other one I saw? Oh, oh, um, Bad Education with Hugh Jackman and Alison Janney. And uh, based on a true story about a, a high school in Long Island, I, I recommend that one. Those are my two movies on the, the plane. I feel like I've kind of got my rhythm. If I have an evening flight for like these 16 hour flights going back and forth to Asia, I, uh, I watch a movie, pop a melatonin, and then I'm out for like hopefully eight hours. And then I wake up again and I watch another movie and have breakfast. And then it's, and then it's over and it's painless, relatively. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are, those are things that come to mind now. Um, a friend recommended Sex in the City. 
never seen it before. So um, I've enjoyed that. Uh, can definitely relate to some of just like being young and living in New York. So that's, it's made me nostalgic for the city, especially the city as it was. Um, what was your most memorable moment on the stage, such as fun mistakes or anything? Oh, I live for these things. Um, doing a long run of a show, um, I will never say it gets boring. It's always different every day. But, um, but my favorite parts are the things where little tiny things go wrong. Um, the first, the most, one of the most recent things for me that was um, kind of horrible was um, I had to get this thing removed on my nose at the dermatologist. And I just didn't realize the effects. Um, it's basically like they took this thing off and then they put a bandage on it. And I, <laughs> I, they're like, afterwards, after they'd done the procedure, this was on a Friday, so we have a show that night and then four more shows on the weekend. So they said, um, yeah, just, just, just be safe. Like, don't do any exercise. Don't, like, go to a sauna or just be anywhere hot. And um, I'm thinking, yeah, 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 that's fine. And then I get to the show and then I'm like, this is... <laughs> Like, literally what I do is, like, exercise on stage in so many layers of clothing. And so, I, I of course, I'm going to get hot. And so, anyway, the band-aid that they stuck, this little tiny thing up, up here, um, it started to come off. And um, and during Managers 2, um, it was, like, flapping like this. And um, and it was bleeding. So then um, Claire, or Christine, she comes over to me. We have a little hubbub moment and um, where we're just... Where we, we're not saying lines or singing, but we're we're talking to each other in character. But she's like, um, Matt, your uh, your band-aids, pull it off, pull it off, and wipe your face. You're bleeding. <laughs> and so um, I went upstage because I had a second to do it. But then I I just knew I didn't get it. And um, and so um, I'm speaking and interacting with the rest of the people on stage. You know, like the managers and Madame Giri, and everyone's looking at me. And then I. I don't know, something in my eyes was just like, I know, I know. And we all just started, like, we literally laughed our way through it. I mean, don't tell our bosses. It went, um, we did our best, but it was definitely one of the funnier Manager's 2 moments. I, I just, yeah, it was so horrible. And then I had to go up at the end of the thing and just be like, <laughs> so, it just be war between us. <laughs> Knowing that I had, like, blood dripping. Um, so anyway, the funny thing, though, is I went backstage and cleaned it up and put a new band-aid on and um and then in the the photos from press call or from um curtain call later um i saw in the, the evening when people posted them you couldn't see it so i was like maybe maybe they had no idea that we were laughing at the blood or the band-aid flipping um so yeah i maybe no one knew and was just like what is up with them why are they being so weird and why are they not really singing they're just sort of like half singing and laughing so that was um, my more recent fun one. Um, another one, I will say, like, this doesn't happen that often. Um, it's such a well-oiled machine, uh, Phantom of the Opera and our production especially. And uh, so not, not, stuff, not a lot of stuff happens. But um, and one of my other favorite ones um, was during the time when, when Megan Paterno was here, we were doing the, um, the dressing room scene, and I just told her I was going to go get my hat. So I go to get my hat and I come back and I, and I'm like, the first thing I do is I try to go into the dressing room again. And cause I'm like, let's go out for dinner. And, uh, I went to touch the door handle and it fell off in my hands. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to, uh, be like m m increasingly more frustrated in the fact that she's not answering and the door is locked and I can hear a voice in there. And so, um, normally it's like a progression of increasingly like, louder knocks but knowing that there's nothing holding the door closed anymore i literally had to just be like <laughs> just like tap 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 <laughs> and uh, so anyway and then i had to like i couldn't just like leave the door handle anywhere so i i had it in my hand put it in my hat and then i'm like christine angel so um yeah those are the the two ones that come to mind um costume department wouldn't love to hear this or, or wigs but we do love a a wig or costume malfunction. It just keeps it fresh and interesting and keeps us present. So, um, yeah, I, I live for any crazy onstage moment. And I feel like there's, there's been more. I really should keep a list. I really should. Um, cause I know I would get a kick out of it. Anyway, um, let's see. How long have you been in the acting industry? Oh God, a long time. <laughs>
<laughs> but I love it. I wouldn't do anything else. Are you an angel without wings? You're so kind. Oh, that means so much to me. Um, one of the, the best things about doing Phantom is uh, not only getting the lovely like notes and messages from fans about what I do in the show, but like I think something that means more to me is is hearing that I've that like I know you enjoy me as a as a person or like I've helped you get through a dark time or um the show has or yeah so that's been a real treat um because I try to be the best person I can be and so I don't know anyone who thinks I'm helping them out or or making them happy or laugh or smile that that means I've done my job so I'm very happy to to do that what? Oh, uh-oh. There's the sirens. Hopefully nothing bad is happening. Um, yeah, so, um, let's see next. What made you a musical actor? Uh, I always sang, and this is how it all began. And, uh, I, um, oh, the phone's going. Let's see. <laughs> let's see. I always sang, and I was in the American Boy Choir, and it's a professional boy choir that actually has ceased to exist in the last few years. Um, but it was an amazing experience. I got to perform all over the world and it was a school as well. So like we had three choirs, a training choir and two touring choirs. And we spent, um, all, like it's middle school. So I'm like fifth to eighth grade and it was a boarding school. I actually was a day student. It was in Princeton, New Jersey is where the school was. And, uh, yeah, we, we toured all over the world and made amazing recordings, got to perform in amazing halls. And um, so that's kind of where my performing, uh, my interest in performing really began. And I always sang after that because like that was my thing. Um, and then did a couple musicals in, in high school. But um, it wasn't really until college when I was a, a music major at Northwestern. I was studying to be more of a classical singer. I... Uh, would go to see all the plays and musicals on campus. And I was like, I really like this. And so I auditioned to be in the musical theater program. And it wasn't like I was just accepted with open arms. I kind of got in in the back door and um, worked my way up. And I took acting class. And um, the acting class really inspired me and made me realize that what I loved about being on stage was the stories and being on stage with other people. And that is, is how I started to get interested in acting. But the funny thing, though, is... Let me take a sip of water. Is though, um, there wasn't a ton of interest in me um, for musicals in college. I, uh, I did... I played, like, leads in plays, and then had, like, one lead in an opera, and then a lot of ensemble roles. And I uh, couldn't get cast in the musicals. And I, I, definitely, I, talk, I went up to the, the guy running the musical theater program, and I was like, hey... Um, would love to be able to do musical, um, any like tips or, so basically it's like, you can't sing musical theater like you're singing classical music. And so I was like, oh, okay, get that. And then, um, so I recorded myself and practiced and, and it really is, um, for people who are, I don't know if there's anyone listening who is coming more from the classical world. It's funny. Like, I think you really think that there are, are like you, you're singing in a musical theater style, but it's a lot, there's a lot more to it and it takes some time to, be able to, because I think it's a lot of different, it's it's like stylistic, so on. It was like learning how to l learn the style, vocal stylings, and and stylings of like different types of musical theater music. So um, yeah, so but finally by the time I finished school, I kind of figured out how to do musical theater. And then, yeah, came to, did I actually went to Asia. I don't know if anyone knows this, but um, I, my, one of my first jobs out of college was doing sound and music excuse me, in China and Taiwan. Um, and that's when I left. I did six months of the tour and then moved to New York. But, uh, but yeah, it was an amazing experience. And um, and so, yeah, so I came to the city and started doing a whole bunch of plays and musicals. And um, and then, yeah, things started happening for me with musical theater. Like, uh, I did Fantastics in New York for three years. Um, and then um, I did a bunch of... I was thinking, like, I needed to do get back to like my roots, like what, what got me so excited about, about theater. And that was a lot, like a lot of great roles in plays. So I did, played some great roles in plays for a couple of years. And then, um, a gentleman's guide to love and murder got me, uh, I went on the first national tour of that. And that was a dream show of mine. 
and I am so glad I got to have that experience. Um, and that came, got me back to the city. And then, then that, right away I got, um, I started standing by for Sweeney Todd in New York um, for this really cool production. You guys should check it out. Um, it's not happening anymore, but um, you can read up about it. It was a, a production of Sweeney Todd set in a, in a functioning pie shop. It originated from London at Harrington's Pie Shop, which was like an actual pie shop. And um, I mean, for people who know Sweeney Todd, it's uh, it's about um, a guy who seeks vengeance, but um, Mrs. Lovett has this great idea that we can put, we can kill people, and because that, that that helps um, Sweeney and his vengeance um, and revenge, and then we'll put them into pies, because um, times is hard, as she says. And uh, so, I mean, how funny is it to literally do Sweeney Todd in and then eat meat pies? So they brought that production to New York and they uh, converted this really cool off-Broadway theater down in the village into a pie shop. And it literally looked exactly like maybe a tiny bit bigger version of Harrington's Pie Shop in, in London. And it was one of the coolest experiences of my life because it was immersive. The audience was up right we were like we did the action around them and among them and it was just such a cool experience done with very minimal props everything all the props we used were things that would exist within a pie shop so like rolling pins and there was flour and and uh yeah it was just so cool and we and silverware we did choreography with silverware and plates and so cool and so yeah and then from there i auditioned for phantom of the opera and for the world tour and um and then before sweeney closed i knew i was going to be doing that so it's it's been a great stretch of, of musical theater um so who knows what will we'll follow this but um i would love to do a play again but i'm i'm enjoying this this journey